the continents of yes. Europe and America are moving apart geologically, <laughs> and um, Iceland is growing by a few centimeters every year. What we take for granted today was an incredible revolution in geology 50 years ago, the unifying concept of plate tectonics. Based on exciting seagoing expeditions in the 1960s, I would have loved to be on board of any of these expeditions, a serial of seminal papers showed that new ocean floor is constantly being created as plates move apart and the gap is being filled by magma. When plates collide and sink into the mantle, Volcanic arcs and mountain ranges form, and transform faults form where plates move past each other, and cities like San Francisco know about the earthquake potential of this motion. So, um, 50 years later, there are still many open questions about the detailed processes of plate tectonics, and the driving forces and the research frontiers today lie in the unexplored part of the oceans where we know very little about the local geology and tectonic processes and in the digital revolution that offers many chances for geosciences. The relative motion of, uh, of plates causes earthquakes that nicely outline the plate boundaries here all over the place. And the analysis of these earthquakes has greatly helped us to understand plate tectonics. I want to focus here now on the mid-ocean ridges that you can see here as a continuous band of seismicity in our oceans. And if you have a closer look, you can see that it's not that continuous on fast-spreading ridges, but it's much more continuous um, on the so-called slow-spreading ridges. The um, seismicity is just about strong enough to be recorded on land, and so the instrument I am using to look at seismicity, to learn about the buildup of the new ocean plates, are seismometers that we need to install on the bottom of the seafloor and get them back, of course. This has been done on the easily accessible ridges like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Here you can see an image of the ridge, and we've learned about two different spreading modes. In the center of these ridges, there's volcanoes, and the lithosphere, the plate, as we uh, call it, um, is very hot, and if it's hot, it cannot break in earthquakes. So there's very few earthquakes. When we move to the um, more colder uh, lithosphere, towards the end of a segment, um, the plates are just being pulled apart, and you can see that there's a lot of earthquakes that nicely delineate how these plates are pulled apart. And the colder it gets, we expected that this kind of tectonic pulling apart would prevail also um, for the so-called ultra-slow spreading ridges. And these ridges are very poorly explored because they lie in the remote parts of the Arctic Ocean and the Southern Ocean. And not a single seismic record exists from these ridges. So we simply extrapolated our models of plate tectonics and accepted that we would have tectonic spreading. In 1999, something very strange happened. There was an enormously large swarm of earthquakes here, and a submarine expedition recorded a lava flow. So according to the prevailing theory of plate tectonics, there shouldn't have been a volcano in the first place, and a volcano shouldn't produce that many earthquakes. So two years later, the first international expedition called Amore, Arctic Mid-Ocean Ridge Expedition, set out on two icebreakers to map for the first time uh, Gackle Ridge, and it produced nine publications in Nature and greatly challenged our understanding of plate tectonics, because there were many more volcanoes than expected. But these volcanoes were widely spaced, and in between there were stretches where there was absolutely no earth crust, no magma, and the earth mantle rocks lay bare on the on the surface of the seafloor. I started with my DFG-funded Eminöter junior research group to analyze the seismicity of ultra-slow spreading ridges. And we quickly realized that in places where there was a lot of magma, a nice magnetic anomaly pattern, there were many earthquakes. And in these places with the mantle rocks, the cold places, there were few earthquakes. So it was just vice versa from any faster spreading ridge. But this is based on uh, records on land. And in order to understand this better, we absolutely needed to get 
somehow um, local seismic records from these places, but the ocean is totally ice covered and there's no chance to get your seismometer back. So what I did is an equally risky business. I um, deviated to the um, ultra slow spreading southern ocean and deployed two networks of um, ocean bottom seismometers in very uh, unfavorable working um, conditions. And, um, um, got those instruments back, luckily, because I organized a large international dis, um, expedition. We stayed for a month in this area and we could wait for uh, days with less than four meters of waves to get our, back our seismometers. So our experiment was, uh, in principle, totally simple, the processing method standard, but we got very exciting results. Um, here you can see now the cross-section um, along a tectonic section and a magmatic section, and the dots are the earthquakes we recorded. So first of all, we found the deepest mid-ocean ridge earthquakes known. They are um, 35 kilometers deep instead of 15, and this means that the lithosphere, the plate, is much colder than in any of our models. What we also can see is that this uh, boundary here undulates and it becomes shallower wherever there's volcanoes. So here is the idea how this um, little melt is channeled towards the volcanoes and we get these widely spaced um, volcanoes. But the real interesting feature was, um, so yeah, the melt can flow to the, towards the volcanoes. The real interesting feature was this gap in seismicity wherever there is mantle rocks on um, the surface. When mantle rocks get in contact with water, a very soft mineral forms, it's called serpentinite, and this cannot break in earthquakes. So here was our explanation why there's so little seismicity in these places. It was surprising to see that this serpentinization goes down to 15 kilometer depths because this requires that there's also the flow of water down to 15 kilometer depths. So why were we all so excited about this um, serpentinization? Serpentinization drastically alters the physical and the chemical physical properties and the chemical co composition of an ocean plate it's the key player in the water cycle um, in the geosphere the serpentinization reaction produces heat and it releases hydrogen and methane into the ocean and it may fuel deep sea life up to now, the, the area we can sample and get access to is very shallow with dredging and drilling. And from seismic studies on faster spreading ridges, we have a feeling that this um, serpentinization may be close to folds going down to two to four kilometer. I found now 15 kilometer. That's a totally different dimension. What we couldn't find out with uh, my study is um, how does this serpentinization look like? Is it only localized on some um, faults, or is it all over the place, maybe? This we cannot find out, but we had the lucky um, coincidence that there's earthquakes below, and these send rays through this area, so we can sample an otherwise very difficult to access region but we need modern techniques for it. And here is the digital revolution coming in. By now, we can not only use the first arrival time of an earthquake to learn about the seismic velocity of a medium, we can use the full waveform and get more information. We don't even depend on earthquakes with the so-called ambient noise tomography. We can use the ambient noise and get information about the structure between receivers. That's done here. It's a beautiful image of the interior, the hot interior of Mount St. Helens volcano that you can easily image without earthquakes. But if you have a look, all these triangles are seismometers that needed to be deployed. And you need for this technique very high quality in, um, records. To deploy such a network in an ocean is extremely costly. In an ice-covered ocean, I would say it's almost impossible. So, and the other problem is that um, in, at sea, with all the waves, it's hard to get really good quality seismic records. So 
what I did in order to push these new techniques and try to go to Gaggle Ridge, where we think that we can explore this phenomenon of deep fluid cycling best. I first deployed the largest um, ever mid-ocean rich ocean bottom size non-monitor network, so we can have a network where we can try to adapt these techniques, the new techniques, to the marine environment. So this is just ongoing. Then I did something very risky. I developed the first um, ocean bottom seismometer that hopefully can be recovered underneath sea ice. Polarstern brought it into its location four weeks ago, and next year I will know if I get the first ever seismic record from this entire um, ridge, the first ever record in place. And currently I'm trying to pull together a large international expedition, and we hope to go to this location to study a deep fluid um, circulation, and this um, expedition, it will be called ALOIS, Arctic Lithosphere um, Ocean Interaction Study, it will be the first dedicated large expedition 20 years after the so successful Amore. And um, we will have the most modern deep sea observing technology with us. So, um, even if we get all excited about the digital revolution and the chances it offers for geology, we must not forget to still make strong efforts to go to the remote places of our planet, even with simple methods. Because I think that plate tectonics we can only understand in full if we know about all its aspects and appearances. And I'm sure that here, in the remote part of our ocean, there are still many surprises for plate tectonics. Thank you. <laughs>